our speaker of the hour. Um, I guess this will be your official name, Samuel Barclay, but it's going to go by Sam. That's what I call him anyway. He is the preaching minister for the Waldorf Church of Christ in Waldorf, Maryland. So he's, he's more than a few hours away from, from home. He is a graduate of the Southeast Institute of Biblical Studies that have been back in 2012. Uh, and he has been involved full-time in ministry since then for about eight years or so now. He has been happily married to his wife, Jackie, for 15 years. They have three wonderful children. Sean, who is 20, who is not here. Christian, who is 14. And Jaden, who is 12. And they're both here, right? They are here. Um, Sam is the salt of the earth. He is a good man. And he, he loves God. He loves God's people. And we had an opportunity when we were meeting. Okay, we, got it. we, we want to populate the lectureship with some alumni. Who are we going to bring in? And I had the pleasure of calling Sam to invite him to be here today. Well, actually, let's be last year. Uh, but COVID messed that up. But here we are. Uh, Sam, it's, it's your time to speak, brother. Good afternoon. Thank you, Brother Evans, for introducing me this afternoon and thankful for the brethren here for inviting me to come and to speak at the lectureship. Hope something I say in this lesson will help you in your desires and your efforts to do the Lord's will or grow in faith or grow in your spiritual maturity. But this particular afternoon, I'll be speaking on the, one of the great I am's, Christ being the good shepherd. You know, one of the inherent facts of life that is and always been true is that our perception of certain things in life determines our attitudes and reactions to them. This is especially true when it comes to authority. Depending on how our or our upon our personal perception of the authority figure, we can sometimes be left with a deep appreciation for that individual or we can be left with respect or sometimes we can be left with fear and gratitude, disdain or indifference. Um, to use myself as an example, in the past, I had fear of certain people and organizations had authority over me because of my perception of them was faulty. Uh, it led to either ingratitude or, or disdain sometimes. And being young and ignorant, I, I've, uh, you know, I've, I, at that time, I, I didn't really truly appreciate some authority figures in my life. I, I kept thinking about the, the police when I was younger, feared them. Many times because I was ungrateful of them because I didn't really understand truly their role in my life when I was young and ignorant. Teachers kind of uh, were that way with me as well. Uh, I was indifferent toward them and the role they played in my life because I didn't understand uh, at the time their importance in my life. And we can go on different, you know, uh, examples of, of authority figures that sometimes we didn't have the right perception of when we were younger. And, 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 and that's for me, is, is there's many different examples, but for one, for many, is God. In Christ, some in the world have disdain for him because they're indifferent for him or indifferent to him because they don't see the need for him, for his management of their lives. And what's sad is that sometimes even the Lord's church, people can end up that way or either their action shows a lack of appreciation for Christ's authority in their lives because they truly don't understand um, the, the nature in which God and Christ wants to manage our lives. The perception is off when it comes to the perspective of Christ and his willingness and desire to be an authoritative figure over their lives. And as a result, they, they fall short in the standard of behavior needed to truly gain the blessings of Christ's authority. And the, the standard of behavior is summed up in the idea of being a submissive, totally submissive to, to Christ, his will and his authority over their lives. And to be blessed by that, we have to obtain it in that way. There's no other way for us to obtain the blessings of Christ's authority over lives. To have a, a perception of appreciation of, of, of who he is and what he desires to do in managing our lives. 
When I think about that idea, I can't help but think about a story about a man named Earl Weaver. Some of you may know this man. He's, if you're a baseball fan, you may know who he is. Uh, he's a former manager of the Baltimore Orioles, and, and the story is told about how he handled one of his stars, Reggie Jackson. And the story goes that he had a rule that no one could steal a base unless given the sign to steal. And some of you who know maybe Reggie Jackson and how kind of player he was, this upset Reggie Jackson and because he felt he knew the pitchers and catchers well enough to judge who he could steal and not steal off of. And so one game he decided to steal without a sign. And he got a good jump off the pitcher and easily beat the throw to second base. And as he shook the dirt off his uniform, he looked at the bullpen and kind of smiled with delight towards the bullpen, feeling that he kind of had, you know, uh, he, he, he was vindicated in his judgment to jump second base. Um, and after the game, later, the, the manager, Weaver, took Jackson aside and explained to him why he hadn't given the steal sign. He first explained the reason why he didn't give the steal sign because the next batter was Lee May. And he was the best power hitter other than Jackson. And so when Jackson stole second, first base was left open. And so then the other team, knowing that he's the second best hitter, walked May intentionally, taking the bat out of his hands. Second reason why he didn't call the steal, the following batter hadn't been strong against that pitcher, and so we were felt that he had to send up a pinch hitter to try to drive in the men on base. But because of what Jackson did, uh, that left Weaver without a bench strength later on in the game and when he needed it, and essentially they lost the game. And so after hearing the, the manager talk for a while, you know, Jackson kind of understood what the problem was. And he says, or he realized that the problem was that Jackson, Reggie Jackson, saw only his relationship to the pitcher and the catcher, but Weaver saw the whole game. He was watching the whole game. And, you know, this story kind of is an illustration of the, 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 what God does for us and why we should trust in his management over our lives, why we should trust in God being a great guardian over our lives, a great shepherd over our lives, because one of the things that God is able to do for us, he's able to see the whole of life. We can only see so far. God can see everything. God sees the bigger picture. And thus, he is worthy of our trust and his ability to have authority and control and guardianship over our, own, over our whole entire lives. And the only way that we're able to, to fully submit to that wonderful blessing of God is, is for us to have a perspective of we truly trust in that ability of God. That God is in Christ, his son being the uh, divinely, uniquely qualified to be the, the guardian of our lives, the guardian of our souls, the manager of our lives. And that's the goal of this lesson, is to remind us of that truth that is taught to us in Christ's parable of him being the what? The great shepherd, the good shepherd over our lives. You know, one of the things that this particular, uh, you know, a parable about himself, this title that he gives, gives himself in his parable is that, you know, it reveals to us that Christ didn't just come to earth just to merely give us the opportunity for salvation. Christ came to not only provide for us, but to guide and manage our lives in a way where we can be guaranteed of reaching salvation. I think that's what Hebrews 11 and verse 6 teaches us, right? For without faith is impossible to please God, for he that comes to God must believe that, first of all, he is, and that he's a reward of those that diligently seek him. I think that's a, a, a verse that tries to get us a trust in the management of God's care over our lives. That if we seek him with faithful obedience to him and to his will, he will reward us with salvation. We can be guaranteed of that. We can trust in that. But again, that's what this parable is all about, to get us to understand that and to trust in that fact about God and Christ and his willingness to be a guardian over our lives. And this lesson is kind of focused on reminding us of that truth, that Christ is the good shepherd. He claims to be the good shepherd in John chapter 10, verses 1 through 18, which is my uh, set of verses that I will be dealing with today, where he talks about uh, him being this, this want to be this, this person in our lives, the Yes, the title that he gives himself that is, is a metaphor used to give us an understanding of the fact that he wants to providentially guide our lives here and now all the way until eternity. It's not to be understood as Jesus' occupation. You know from Scripture in Mark 6 and verse 3 that in life he was a carpenter. But here for us in our lives spiritually, he desires to be a good shepherd over our lives. Those who are of his flock, those of us in the church. 
that not only does he want to be our Lord and Savior, but he wants to be someone who is there for us and takes care of us each and every single day and strengthens us and guides us here in life through all of our uh, shortcomings and failures and issues and trials and tribulations. And with our trust in him, we can have hope and confidence that one day we'll reach eternal life in heaven. It also expresses his intent to be a discontinual manager over our lives. He wants to do it for our good because he is good. He's the only person that embodies the term good in the fullest extent. And thus he calls us to trust in him by this parable to, to get us to realize that he is the only person that we can trust in life to be a good manager over our lives. At the same time, within the context of the parable, he says, he reveals to us, he's the only one that's uniquely qualified to do so. Because in John chapter 10 and verse 14, he says that he's, he knows all the sheep of the flock of God. He knows them, and uh, that means he has a deep, intimate, and he has a individual knowledge of all the, the, the sheep that's in his flock. And so, therefore, he is the, the one manager in the life of man that can, as you could qualify to do what? To be able to um, be in their lives in a way where their spiritual lives will be successful. You know, I can't help but think about the illustration of Earl Weaver. Why was he so important? Why, would, why did, you know, Reggie Jackson need to know Earl Weaver? Well, because Earl Weaver knew the game of baseball, but also he knew his players individually. He knew which ones to use in the game for them to be successful in winning the game. And that the same ideas apply to Christ and why he's the great manager of our lives or the good shepherd of our lives. Because one of the things that he knows about us is that he knows us individually, he loves us all, and he will use us all and, and, and provide for us the ability to be successful in our lives of faith that will lead us to eternal life in heaven. You know, we should have total trust in Christ's ability to do this because why he has one of the blessings that or one of the things that makes him uniquely qualified to do this, he's omniscient. He's all-knowing. And he uses that all-knowing power in our lives to manage our lives, each of us individually. One person wrote in this idea that he says, the same way in which a good mechanic, an artist, and a gardener has deep knowledge of the materials he works with, Christ has deep knowledge of his sheep. He knows them through and through. He knows exactly how to provide for their every need, specifically and I would say also corporately as a church, and is uniquely capable in, in doing so. He's omniscient, all-knowing in all of our lives. You know, Psalms 147 and verse 5 talks about that, where the Bible says, Great is our Lord and abundant in strength, and his understanding is infinite. And he uses that infinite understanding to what? Manage and guard and, and guide our lives. So he's perfectly equipped to be the manager of our lives. And we should submit to that authority. And, 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 and we also have verses where Christ tells us that, that he's uh, uniquely equipped to be the manager of our lives. We have John 14, verse 6, where Christ says in that particular verse, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one has any hope of being successful in a Christian life unless you submit to me managing your life. Same idea is taught in John chapter 8 and verse 12. Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. If I want to have the light of life, I should submit to the authority and to the guardianship and guidance of Christ. One of the things also that we see in the, in the parable of Christ being the good shepherd that should give us all trust in him being the great garden over our lives. And one of the things that he did was he's willing to lay down his life for us. Him laying out his life for us is the thing that provided for our spiritual security. You know, it's one of the main themes of the parable of him being a worthy shepherd and qualified shepherd over our lives. He's not like the hired hand talked about in John 10 and verses 12 through 14. The one who was only concerned about his own welfare and maybe we can probably imply that he's only concerned about his pocket and just doing the job for to take care of himself. He's not like the hired hand, Christ says. He's like... He, he's, he's the good shepherd who is willing to not, he doesn't care about what's going to benefit him. He's caring about the sheep. He, he's willing to lay down his life for the sheep. The sheep's welfare is more important than his own welfare. He stands on a contrast to the hired hand. His desire is for the care of the sheep, the loving care of the sheep. It reminds me of David and his willingness 
to take care of his father's flock in the book of 1 Samuel 17, verse 36 and 37. His willingness to protect that flock was so strong that he's willing to fight against a bear and a lion. You know, and he was able to be successful in defending the flock against a bear and a lion. But I think it took a little bit of what? Putting his life on the line to be willing to fight for that sheep. And, and, and Christ was willing to do the same thing for us. Gave his life on the cross for our welfare. Gave, you know, let, you know, gave his life for us. To put himself in the way of danger from our predator. We know our predator is Satan. Put himself in the way, gave his life so that we can be free from uh, the, the danger of Satan. You know, he gave his life to nullify the only threat that Satan had over us, which is death. And he gave his life to die for us so that death would be passed over on us. Um, we know that through, through the scriptures that, that he gave his life for that particular purpose because he is the good shepherd. His concern is for us was more, his concern for us was more than his concern for his own life. That should give us every incentive to make sure that our lives are truly under his authority because He's a good shepherd. He's not motivated by any other motive than to see us secure from our enemy, Satan, to see us uh, good, to see us blessed, to see us uh, have the hope of eternal life in heaven. You know, I think you can go to Ephesians chapter five, verse 25 to 27, where it talks about Christ being the husband and we being the bride of Christ, that he wants to see us nourished and cherished um, and clean so that we can be that way for him for eternity. And I think the idea is implied in the idea of Christ being the good shepherd. He's, he wants to protect us. He strives to be over our lives and managing us. If we put ourselves under his care and management, he wants to protect us spiritually now and for eternity. But also the parable, or the parable that Christ teaches also reveals another truth about what makes Christ the good shepherd. Why we should allow for him to be over our lives because he provides also for our spiritual nourishment. You know, John 10, verse 1 through 4, we see the analogy of the good shepherd and how he's willing to lead his flock out into the fold. You know, we see that in John chapter 3, uh, John chapter 10, verses 3 through 4, where he uh, makes that statement in that, in that parable. And, and he talks about the idea of, of, of the sheep or the shepherd enters the door, right? John chapter 10 and verse 2. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. And when he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. And then we come down to verse number nine. And the, the, he says, I am the uh, shepherd, a good shepherd. I'm the door. And if anyone answers me, he will be saved and I will go in and, and will go in and out and find pasture. And I think the idea there is that the shepherd of our souls or the good shepherd of Christ, he wants to lead us out to find pastures, to find what? Spiritual nourishment. That's his goal of, of being the shepherd of our lives, providing for the nourishment that we need spiritually to be healthy. He wants us to be that way. He wants us to be in good health and in goodness and, and be blessed with all of his blessings. He wants to provide for us life abundantly. John 10 and verse 10. You know, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. He wants to provide for us the ability to have our needs met both physically and spiritually. I think the idea there is being the shepherd over our lives and make sure that we are able to have that wonderful benefit of his care over our lives. I think the idea is also expressed in Matthew 6 and verse 33, where Christ says he that um, says in that verse that, you know, uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. And if you look at the Verses preceding that verse in Matthew 6, we know that deals with food, clothing, and shelter. But then we also know Paul's words in Ephesians 1 and verse 3, where Paul says that all spiritual blessings are found in Christ Jesus. I think both those verses together gives the idea of what Christ wants to do for us. He wants to provide for our nourishment spiritually, whether it be physically or spiritually. And those who are under his management, those who are under his care, his guardianship, can have total trust in that. He promises us that. I am the good shepherd and I will give them life abundantly. And it's something that we need because of the fact that we will deal with trials and tribulations in life, whether it be physically or spiritually. You know, in any given year, it's said that one out of five people who are employed in America will deal with depression and anxiety and, in, and sometimes insomnia. It's said that one in four people in their life will experience mental health issues in any given year. One out of 25 adults or 9.8 million Americans will experience mental illness this year. And that is serious enough to interfere with or impact major life activities. 
And they also say kids are not immune either. One out of five youths between the age of 13 and 18 and 13% of children aged between ages 8 through 15 will live with mental health disorders. And the reality of life is that we all will face some of these things from time to time in our lives. We will suffer all kinds of mental issues, spiritual issues, trials and tribulations and struggles. But Christ promises if we seek his management, his care in our lives, we will never stay there. You know, we see what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 and verses 8 through 10, where Paul reminds us of this truth that we will suffer from time to time. We will struggle from time to time. But we know that we will what? We are, we're afflicted in every way. We're not crushed. We may be perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. But we, because of Christ, will always be able to recover from those things. Essentially what Paul is trying to teach us in those verses. Because Christ will be there for us. He's our great shepherd. He promises to be the guardian of our souls. And he will always lead us to the nourishment that we need to overcome whatever we deal with in life. That's an in, involved in him being the bread of life. That's involved in him being the light of the world. I don't have to live in darkness that I'm blind. I, I, I have light. I don't have to live in darkness. I, I, I can always see um, through Christ and through his guardianship that I can always overcome whatever I face. He will lead me to the comforting waters of the spirit. John 7, verse 37, 39 where he talks about he's going to lead his sheep to pastures and to waters. And I believe the idea there, because of what John 7 and verse 37, 39 says, is that he's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's going to lead us to the waters of the Spirit, the nourishing waters of the Holy Spirit, who was the comforter of our lives, who will be there for us by our side, always leading us to a life of inner well-being if we continue to what? To have Christ be the guardian of our souls. I need that comforter in my life. The comfort that's given to me at baptism, that it also guides me through his word and that my life is maintained and blessed because of my submission to that, that care in my life. And so all those ideas I think are expressed in simply in what Christ is trying to get us to trust in. Him being the good shepherd over our souls. That he'll provide for our security, he'll provide for our nourishment, whether physically and spiritually, but also he wants to provide for our abundant living. John 10, verse 10, right? I am the good shepherd, Christ says, and I know my own, my own knows me, and I'll lay down my life for my sheep, and I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. He wants to provide for our abundant living. That's what he desires to do as being the good shepherd over our lives. An expression that's used by Christ to describe and denote the quality of life that he promises to provide for his followers, for his sheep. However, what does that uh, expression entail? I mean, what does it hold? What does the promise hold? I mean, does it hold the promise of a life free of problems? Is issues in conflict? Um, well, we know that's not for sure. You know, we know one thing for sure. Christ never promised that freedom of problems, issues, and conflict. He, all, he promised that we will bring, he didn't, he, he bring peace, but also a sword. He promised that some of our greatest enemies sometimes will be those of our own household. He taught through the Spirit, through his apostles, that we'll have to suffer for his namesake. He taught that even in the Sermon on the Mount, that we will suffer sometimes for his namesake. Many will be persecuted for his namesake. And the question is, well, how can this be true? How can we have abundant life? but still have to deal with the problems, trials, and tribulations. Well, because of Christ being the great shepherd of our souls promises us that he will be there for us in the midst of all that we go through, to support us, to nurture us, to help us endure obstacles in a way where we'll end up being blessed for good. He will provide for us all the knowledge and the resources and guidance needed to accomplish this outcome. And it's in abundance in Christ. And we can have an abundant life if we submit to his guardianship over our lives. I think the idea is probably best explained in the idea of receiving funding for a research project. You know, um, that could be a good example of, I think, what Christ is trying to get us to understand. All the resources and support um, given by the benefactor is given to the research scientists, and it's theirs. But it doesn't mean that, you know, um, they will escape the difficulties of carrying out the research. No. But it's fully supported, it's, full, it's abundantly supplied, but it's how one handles the resources. It's how one handles the support 
that determines whether or not the outcome is going to be good. And Christ is saying, is, I'm going to be there for you. I'm going to give you all the things that you need to be able to endure life and have everything turn out for good and to be able to be strong and, 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 and steadfast in the midst of all you're going through because I'm going to be your benefactor. I'm going to be your good shepherd. You know, David wrote about that idea even in the, in the Psalms with, about how God does that through his law and through his word. You know, Psalm 119 and then verses 97 to 104 talks about how God's word was a source of, a protection in his life, a source of stability in his life from his enemies and from many different things. You know, David says in that particular verse, uh, how, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies for they are ever, they are, they are ever mine. I have more insight than all my teachers for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the age because I've observed your precepts. I've restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. I have not turned aside from your ordinances, for you yourself have taught me how sweet are your words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. For your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. I think David is writing about the guidance and protection of God's word in his life. And I think all those things that are taught in this verse are, are ideas that are implied in the idea of Christ being the good shepherd over our soul, providing for us through his care and his, and his providential care in our lives and also through his word, the ability to be able to be protected and steadfast and encouraged and strengthened through whatever we may go through in life. Christ promised that through that particular title of his being the good shepherd over our lives. And that should also give us peace of mind and strength and comfort in the midst of all that we go through in life, that he will be there for me. He will never leave me nor forsake me. He'll always be there for me when I'm weak. Uh, he'll be there to strengthen me. I can do all things through him to strengthen me. If I'm going through a struggle of sin, the Bible says he'll provide for me a way of escape. He will provide that for me. Second, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. He will give me insight on how to avoid issues of sin and sinfulness. We see that in verses like Matthew chapter 6 and verse 13 and other verses. He gives me incentive to always seek peace with our enemies, love them and do good and not evil uh, towards them. To not ins return insult for insult or evil for evil, but to do good instead because he will bless me for that, right? Because he what? He works his divine power through my life and through my actions. And it can accomplish abundantly all beyond all that I ask or think. He will be there for me and guard my life. As long as I do his will, he'll be there doing his will in my life as well. And will abund abundantly provide for all of my needs in life. Philippians 4 and verse 19 to where I can always have an abundant life, a life of abundance. And that's what Christ calls for us to trust in him with. Him being the good shepherd over our lives. And so again, I think that's the best illustration to, to kind of understand what Christ is trying to, under, to get us to realize. He's the supplier of the care and resources that if I take them and I apply them to his word and all of his will and all of his things to my life, I will have all the things I need to endure life and end up with a life that is considered abundant through Christ Jesus, where I can have uh, peace of mind in the midst of trials, joy in the midst of suffering and comfort and hope in the midst of all that I face in life. With these perspectives in mind, why would I not strive to do all that I can to submit to Christ's authority in my life as being the good shepherd? over my life. He provides always for what is good. You know, and one thing that we see through this particular set of verses is that he's not trying to keep us away from enjoying life. He's trying to provide for our lives, abundant lives. His commands are not grievous. They're given to, to you to give you the best life imaginable here on earth. Despite all the evil that you will encounter in the world, we will always have a, a hope of things turning out for good because of the fact that we have the good shepherd over our lives. You know, that's one of the things that uh, keeps me strong and encouraged as a minister, as a father, as a man of God, that I can hope and trust in this fact that Christ is going to be there for me, guarding my life, managing my life in a way where I, I can know that all things will turn, off, turn out for my good. Because that's inherent in the teachings and this parable of him being the good shepherd. Thank you for your attention.